By introduction, my name is Bruce Gerald. Uh, I get the honor of serving as president of this great university of which this School of Dentistry is a really important part. Uh, and if there's anything I've learned over the years, it's to appreciate just how excellent, how much excellence there is in every school. And each one is different, and yet each one is excellent. So it's my pleasure to be here uh, to be in this school. Uh, what, what my role here is, is to introduce our speaker briefly, uh, and, and um, then uh, Dr. George will give a more detailed uh, introduction of him. So this is the annual Founders Week Researcher of the Year lecture. Uh, the Researcher of the Year, uh, there is a process to um, get nominations. Uh, for this across the entire university. There's then a, um, a process where the, each school submits a formal proposal to the uh, school, to the campus. Then we have a, a UMB campus-wide process, which includes the faculty senate to evaluate each one uh, and to make a decision, a recommendation as to who should be in this position. And uh, the, the, um, the evaluation is based on a number of things, the years of investigation, the extent of scientific citation, the impact of the uh, individual's findings, particularly on clinical practice and or public policy. Uh, it could be advancing basic biomedical or public policy research or academic scholarship. Uh, and, and of course, this fits in with whatever the strategic plan uh, items are within the um, university. And of course, research is an important part of our uh, strategic plan. So, so that's what this lecture is about today. Um, and um, I just wanna thank you all for being here. Now, the, uh, Dean Reynolds was going to be here, but at the last minute could not be here. Uh, and so he's asked Dr. David George, I think most of you know, uh, to uh, introduce our speaker. So Dr. George. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. I am pleased and proud to be able to introduce Dr. Mankyo Chung, UMB's 2022 Researcher of the Year. Dr. Chung joined the School of Dentistry in 2008 he holds a Doctor of Dental Medicine degree from Ki Young Hee College of Dentistry in Seoul, Korea, where he also earned an MS and PhD degrees. Completed a postdoc fellowship at the Johns Hopkins Medical School Department of Biological Chemistry. Dr. Chung is a dentist scientist who has dedicated his career to studying the neurobiological mechanisms of craniofacial pain, focusing on the roles of trigeminal nociceptive afferents. He has, been, he has spent the last 20 years investigating the electrophysiological and biophysical properties of transient receptor potential ion channels in the context of thermosensation and pain, and is a recognized expert in electrophysiological analysis of heat-gated transient receptor potential channels in the subreceptor level. Along with his pain programs, Dr. Chung's recent interest in neuroregulation of alveolar bone remodeling has been recognized by the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research with an R35 award of 8 million for eight years. During the 14 years since being appointed to the faculty, Dr. Chung has served as a principal investigator on 10 projects funded by the government or industry for a total of $17.4 million. In addition to being an accomplished scientist, Dr. Chung is an extraordinary educator, serving as a mentor for numerous students of diverse backgrounds and in varying uh, stages of their careers. He has demonstrated a strong commitment to academic citizenship, both within the School of Dentistry and the UMB community at large. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mankyo Chung, 2022 UMB Researcher of the Year. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. 
uh, it's my tremendous honor, uh, and and I'm very humbled by uh, receiving this award. I really appreciate uh, being here today to celebrate uh, this Founders Week 2022. And in this presentation, I would like to share our past and current uh, projects that mostly have been developed uh, with the collaboration uh, with uh, my wonderful colleagues at the U uh, UMB. So the title is Trigeminal Nociceptor, the Neural Intersection of Chronic Pain and Alveolar Bony Modeling. The chronic pain is highly prevalent and 20% of uh, US adults suffer from this chronic pain. And 16% of patients uh, visiting dental office had some kinds of orofacial pain during the past year. And as you know, this opioid epidemic is a big problem in the United States and developing non-addictive and non-opioidergic treatments for chronic pain is immediately necessary. So nociceptor is defined as a high threshold sensory receptor of the peripheral somatosensory nerve system that is capable of transducing and encoding noxious stimuli. In other words, nociceptor is a sensory uh, neurons that transducing this pain signal. And trigeminal nociceptor is a nociceptor serving in the craniofacial area. And trigeminal nociceptor has the three branches, as you know, one goes to mandible, one goes to maxillar, and one goes to the forehead area. And the cell, neuronal cell body of this trigeminal nociceptors are located in this trigeminal ganglia, and that transduce pain and then transmit to the brain and so that we can perceive a pain. And we activate these trigeminal nociceptors almost every day by ingesting this uh, capsaicin. And as you know, this capsaicin is an ingredient of the spicy pepper and capsaicin can directly activate these nociceptors. And the activation of this nociceptor invariably produce intense burning pain in oral mucosa and that's why this capsaicin has been used as a very reliable model to produce acute pain in, in experimental animals and also in humans. And this receptor for this capsaicin has been discovered and published in 1997 by uh, the David Julius group in the uh, UCSF. And this receptor was named as a transient receptor potential veniloid subtype one, this trip V1. And surprisingly, this receptor was an ion channel itself. So upon activation by this capsaicin, the channel pore is open and sodium and calcium ions flow from outside of the cell to inside and that depolarized nociceptor and produce action potential firing. And interestingly, this uh, cap uh, capsaicin receptor is a polymodal receptor integrating multiple different noxious stimuli for example, this receptor can be activated not only by capsaicin, but also it can be acti activated by heat. And when you know, capsaicin and heat are applied together simultaneously, that produces greater uh, activation of the receptor and hence greater amount of pain. That's why you know, hot you know, uh, chili pepper is more uh, spicy than uh, the cold chili pepper. And later, this uh, crystal structure of trip one was, was uh, uh, published and it has uh, six transmembrane domain and carbox terminal and N-terminal domain inside of the cell. And it is uh, composed of four different subunits. And eventually this uh, entire work about capsaicin receptor brought a Nobel prize to David Julius in 2021. And I was so much fascinated by this finding when I was a graduate uh, student. And after finishing my training, I was so fortunate to join to Dr. Michael Katerina's lab at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And I worked with him uh, about this different types of heat gated ion channel, for example, trip 3 and trip 4 expressed in skin keratinocyte, though for testing the hypothesis that this skin keratinocyte can contribute to the warm sensation in our skin. And also I worked with this capsaicin receptor for demonstrating that this capsaicin receptor indeed shows dynamic ionic selectivity. So in other words, unlike uh, many other uh, ion channels showing static ionic selectivity, this capsaicin receptor interestingly shows 
a different ionic selectivity over time when it was activated by uh, a capsaicin. And indeed, these properties are actually differently manifested when we use different uh, agonists. For example, when we activate heat, uh, when you activate capsaicin receptor using heat, those kinds of uh, dynamic ionic selectivity was not observed. So I was very interested in investigating how this TRPP1 capsaicin receptor is regulated by polymodal stimuli. So when I uh, have a position in the University of Maryland at Baltimore, I started to ask how this polymodality of capsaicin receptor is modulated. So one of the experiments we have done was uh, to show how this different uh, modality of stimuli can be sensitized when TRPP1 is uh, actually phosphorylated by protein kinase C. And through multiple uh, structure function study, we show that there's one uh, residue, serine S800 uh, residue at the end of this carbox terminal domain is actually important uh, for polymodal sensitization of TRPP1 when it is phosphorylated by uh, protein kinase C. So we suggested that this S800 site is very important in uh, hyperalgesia, but we at, all of these experiments was done in vitro and we didn't have a chance to show that in vivo. Meanwhile, uh, we, our lab collaborated with Dr. Jin Rowe lab in uh, our department, and we studied how this trophy one contributes to the pain from masseter muscle uh, in mice and rats. And we show that in a, a number of paper, uh, we show that this uh, muscle injury or inflammation can indeed uh, increase the glutamate and this glutamate activate uh, metabotrophic and ionotrophic glutamate receptor that, that induce uh, protein kinase C activation and somehow uh, increase the activity of trp one that eventually leads to the increased muscle pain in, uh, in, uh, in mice. So we want to at this time, we didn't know if this serine 800 phosphorylation is actually directly involved in this function. So we directly tested that hypothesis. And John Joseph was a PhD student from programming neuroscience. And he spent six years with me to test that hypothesis by generating a mouse line that uh, in which the serine residue is actually mutated to alanine to prevent the phosphorylation in a trp one 800 site. And in this experiment, interestingly, we were not able to see the hyperalgesia mediated by uh, phosphorylation in response to heat. So uh, thermal hyperalgesia was not affected in these mice. But interestingly, we found that the muscle pain from masseter muscle was uh, decreased. And indeed, in this model, about 40% of entire masseter muscle pain was mediated by trp one but about half of those phenotype was mediated by this phosphorylation of one residue. So this uh, experiment uh, shows that this uh, phosphorylation mediated biophysical or biochemical change in trp one in one uh, residue can indeed produce uh, the robust uh, in vivo phenotype. This is the first time we were able to show the in vivo uh, role of uh, phosphorylation of trp one So all these experiments uh, were, were showing this trp one can increase a pain in our body. But we were also interested in the opposite effect of trp one activation. In other words, capsaicin has been uh, used as an energetic for many centuries. And the, the energetic effect of capsaicin was first reported in 1850. And later, 8% capsaicin patch was developed. And now this uh, patch is approved by FDA to treat different types of uh, neuropathic pain, the pain derived from direct nerve injury. And of course, the, applying this patch you know, produced intense burning pain in patients. However, that is followed by the attenuation of the pre-existing pathological pain. So neuropathic pain was uh, existed in the patients after applying capsaicin, in, the intense burning pain happens, but this existing neuropathic pain is decreased. So 
this cap topical capsaicin can also uh, treat this craniofacial neuropathic pain. And for example, this patient had some nerve damage during the extraction of third molar. And this patient develops neuropathic pain and had a continuous burning pain, uh, which is uh, superimposed by electric shock-like pain triggered by speech and, and chewing. And patient developed mechanical allodynia in mental nerve area, which means that just you know, innocuous stimuli, just touching the skin can cause you know, needle pricking uh, like pain from the skin. And carbamazepine provide only temporary relief and amitriptyline and pregabalin had to be stopped because the central side effect was you know, too much. And in this patient, capsaicin was used and the pain was decreased by half. And one time of uh, application of capsaicin lasts about 12 weeks and the patient is treated every three months. All these uh, clinical uh, effects are not uh, are very well known, but the mechanism of capsaicin induced analgesia are not very well known. So we know it works in human, but we don't really know how it works. The, my interest in this uh, capsaicin induced analgesia mechanism was actually amplified by interaction with Dr. Uh, Jim Campbell, who is a neurosurgeon and chief scientific officer of uh, Centraxion. And he was developing injectable formulation of capsaicin to treat pain from osteoarthritis. And we agreed that the, uh, studying the mechanism of capsaicin induced energesia is very important. And by the uh, support from Maryland Industrial Partnership Grant, we were able to develop a, in, an in vitro model which shows the, the effect of capsaicin ablating the nerve terminal and degenerating the nerve terminal within several minutes after application. So using this model, we have investigated the mechanism, how this capsaicin denervate the nerve terminals. And we found that the capsaicin induced activation of trp one leads to the calcium influx into the nerve terminal. And this influx of calcium through trp one is necessary. And this calcium activate calpane, which is a calcium dependent protease. And this calcium calpane can degradate the neuroskeletal uh, uh, proteins in the axon, which eventually leads to the ablation of nociceptor terminal. So when we inhibit calpane or when we inhibit uh, Depolar depolymerization of microtubule pharmacologically, we were able to completely inhibit the ablation of nociceptive terminal. The real important question here is, is this ablation really uh, you know, associated with energesic effects? Does the ablation lead to energesia or is it just the epiphenomenon happening? So for asking that question, we needed uh, a very reliable in vivo model mimicking this capsaicin this energesia happening in human. So I collaborated with Dr. Feng Wei, who is my next door neighbor. And we uh, asked if this capsaicin can attenuate pain in craniofacial uh, neuropathic pain model. So we used the mouse model of infra infraorbital nerve chronic constriction injury. So in this model, we ligate a branch of a second branch of the trigeminal nerve, and that mimics the traumatic injury of the trigeminal nerves in humans. And that uh, lig ligature produced decrease in mechanical threshold in mice, which means increased uh, mechanical all allodynia. And after the mechanical allodynia developed, we injected a capsaicin to the skin this one time, and we found that this mechanical allodynia is reduced, which means mechanical threshold is increased. And that effect, single injection, actually uh, produced the energetic effect, which lasts more than two weeks in mice. So we were very excited to have this model, and, and we were able to use this model for testing the, the hypothesis related with this capsaicin-induced energesia. So I mentioned the calpain uh, you know, contributes to the uh, ablation of nociceptive terminal. So uh, we tested that in vivo 
uh, in Dr. Chao Bien in Dr. Feng Wei's lab performed this uh, phenomenal uh, study. He uh, monitored the uh, trip V1 positive nerve terminal from the hind pole using two photon microscope before and after the capsaicin injection in the same animal. And before capsaicin injection, there was a lot of tripion positive nerve terminal uh, uh, exist, but after capsaicin, this uh, nerve terminal ablation was evident. But when we uh, gave capsaicin together with this calpane inhibitor, uh, we, this capsaicin induced ablation did not happen. So this calpain-mediated uh, capsaicin-induced ablation of nerve terminal uh, also happens in vivo. And we tested the effect of calpain in uh, pain model. So infraorbital nerve injury, uh, it produced the mechanical uh, allodynia. And we, when we injected capsaicin to the skin, it produced uh, analgesia. But when we injected capsaicin together with the calpain inhibitor, this uh, uh, energetic effect did not happen, which means this ablation of a trifium positive nerve terminal by capsaicin is necessary to produce this energetic effect. So we further confirmed uh, this by using a paclitaxel, which uh, inhibit the microtubule depolymerization. So when we injected capsaicin together with the paclitaxel, this capsaicin induced ablation of nerve terminal was, was actually prevented. And likewise, when we inject capsaicin together with paclitaxel, this uh, energetic effect did not uh, happen. So these uh, studies support that this capsaicin induced energesia is initiated by the ablation of nerve terminal at the site of injection. So why, we, why are we so much excited about this um, mechanism of capsaicin-induced energesia? No, this is already, already you know, approved by FDA. Why do we study mechanism? Because uh, we believe that better understanding of mechanism definitely can improve the treatments. So for example, very important questions is not answered. So uh, I, as I mentioned, this trifium positive uh, nerve are high threshold uh, and heat sensitive nociceptors. How can this high threshold heat sensitive nociceptors mediated, uh, mediate pain evoked by this innocuous mechanical stimuli? The more uh, fundamental question is, we need to understand the cellular, molecular, and genetic identity of primary sensory neurons specifically involved in mechanical allodynia after nerve injury. So now we are performing a, a study to identify the mechanical allodynia specific primary afferents by uh, activity dependent labeling. So this uh, study is performed by Dr. Ting Ting Lee in our lab uh, in collaboration with Dr. Yushin Kim at uh, UT San Antonio and Dr. Michael Katerina at Johns Hopkins. And another very important question that we are asking using this model is, can peripheral treatment reverse this altered brain functions? In other words, it's, it's well known that as pain become more and more chronic, this, the role of uh, brain central nervous system uh, become more and more important. So the pain circuits are known to undergo some changes and altered uh, brain functions uh, plays an important role uh, in centralization of pain. But our study and the, the, the energetic effect of peripheral capsaicin strongly support that this nociceptor contributes to the maintenance of this chronic pain. The real important question is this peripheral treatment, can this peripheral treatment reverse this uh, diseased brain into the normal condition. So our, our hypothesis is that manipulating this peripheral nervous system may not only temporarily attenuate chronic pain symptom, but it also uh, a disease modifying treatment by normalizing this diseased brain without adverse side effects. So we tested this hypothesis in collaboration with uh, Dr. David Seminowicz and Joyce uh, Tessera da Silva in our department. 
uh, and tested the impact of peripheral capsaicin on the plasticity of central uh, pain circuit. So in this experiment, uh, we uh, produced a nerve injury in rats and we applied capsaicin to the skin. And in different times, we uh, performed the functional uh, MRI to uh, evaluate the changes in the brain circuit, pain circuit. And at the end, uh, we uh, artificially silenced uh, the neurons in anterior cingulate cortex, ACC. And we used this as a positive control of, uh, sil of silencing chronic pain because ACC is well known uh, to be critical for affective dimension of pain or unpleasantness uh, uh, of, of uh, pain. So in this experiment, very briefly, the result look like this. In sham group, we calculated the brain connectivity, the whole brain connectivity with uh, anterior cingulate cortex, ACC, and the, the uh, yellow and white uh, present more uh, enhanced functional connectivity. In sham group, we see some connectivity of brain with ACC, but after nerve injury, the brain connectivity to ACC is greatly increased, which means that this connectivity can cause more aversiveness, unpleasantness, or chronic pain in, in these mice. But when we inject capsaicin in nerve injury animal, as you see, this uh, changes, brain changes are greatly reduced. It's almost back to the sham level, the control level, which means this capsaicin administration can decrease the brain connectivity with uh, anterior cingulate cortex. And this is, a, as I said, positive control. This is artificial silencing of the nerve neuronal function in ACC. And that also shows almost the same uh, a change as capsaicin injected group. So we uh, quantify these changes and average functional connectivity of brain with ACC with greatly increased in CCI, the nerve injury group, but in case we injected capsaicin, this functional connectivity strength is almost normalized to the uh, sham level. So these data suggest that this peripheral injection of capsaicin can reverse this chronic pain induced brain change in rats with a uh, nerve injury. So we uh, believe that this uh, trigeminal nociceptors contribute to the maintenance of chronic pain that is derived from multiple uh, etiologies in that happening in craniofacial area, and also targeting these nociceptors and all nociceptive molecules can be effective strategy for treating a chronic pain with fewer adverse side effects. As a dentist a scientist, I was also very uh, interested in uh, pain derived from teeth. And this orthodontic pain is interesting because almost 100% you know, of patients complain pain when they have brace. And this is a mouse model of orthodontic pain. And the, in mice, there's a big space between incisor and molar, and we can place an orthodontic spring like this. And placing the orthodontic spring, that produce uh, pain in a way that you know, decreased by force. So by forces decrease and we, we interpret that as an increased pain. And in animal uh, with this RTX injected into trigeminal ganglia to ablate this uh, nos tripion positive nociceptors, this orthodontic pain is reduced, which suggests this orthodontic pain is also mediated by this tripion positive nociceptors. While we are doing, doing uh, this experiment, Dr. Sheng Wang, who is a postdoc uh, in our lab, suggested a very interesting experiment. And he asked if this orthodontic, uh, if this ablation of nociceptor, trigeminal nociceptor, can decrease uh, this orthodontic tooth movement. So we actually measured the changes in uh, the tooth movement, the extent of tooth movement, like here. So orthodontic whole spring actually moves this first molar uh, by about 80 microns after two weeks. But when we ablated this uh, uh, tripion positive neuron by injecting resonifera toxin, this orthodontic tooth movement was greatly decreased. 
So this was an eye opener for us. And we realized that this nociceptors not only mediate pain, but also it can modulate some bone remodeling in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, around the teeth. Indeed, these nociceptors are densely projected into periodontium and periodontium is a, the tissue surrounding these teeth and teeth is embedded in the alveolar bone and that is covered by gingiva. And this uh, gingiva is an interdental uh, gingiva. And this is a, a picture uh, in mouse interdental gingiva. And as we see this trivial one positive uh, nerve terminals are densely projected uh, into this gingiva around this blood vessel, as well as in inside this epithelium. And in this periodontium, the biggest problem is the infection, bacterial infection. And this infection can uh, lead to the inflammation of the gingiva and also uh, the loss of this alveolar bone that eventually makes this, uh, 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 we lose uh, uh, this teeth. That condition is called periodontitis. Periodontitis is highly prevalent and almost 40% in US adults have this condition, but it's not known if uh, pain sensing nerve, these nociceptors contribute to the progression of this periodontitis. Indeed, these nociceptors are known to produce inflammation. So chemical, mechanical, or thermal activation of nociceptive terminal can activate nociceptor and generate action potential. And that uh, is transmitted uh, through the pain pathway that eventually make us feel pain. At the same time, this nociceptor terminal activation causes the release of neuropeptides from the nerve terminal, like substance P or CGRP, and that causes uh, recruitment of the immune cells and also vasodilation, and that eventually leads to increased inflammation. So this is called the neurogenic inflammation, and it's not clearly known if uh, nociceptors aggravate periodontitis through these kinds of neurogenic inflammation. So we tested this in a mouse model. And in mouse, we can produce uh, periodontitis by placing a ligature around the second molar. And the, the mouse have three molar like this and we place the ligature here that increased the bone loss in uh, the cervical area of this molar. And when we injected a resiniferous toxin to ablate trypheum positive nociceptors, this bone loss was reduced to half. And this experiment was done in a way to ablate this nociceptor preemptively, which you know, is not quite well uh, matched with the clinical condition in which the patients comes after developing periodontitis. So we asked if uh, the functional silencing of nociceptors can reduce the progression of the periodontitis. In this experiment, we have used the chemo inhibitory chemogenetic receptor, which can silence nerve by, uh, the, by the activation, uh, by activation of this clozapine and oxide, the CNO. So when CNO binds to this uh, inhibitory chemogenetic receptor, that silence the nerve function continuously so that we can test the impact of nerve silencing on uh, periodontitis progression. In this uh, experiment, we in one group, we have uh, placed the ligature and after one week, we euthanized the mice and it shows about 0.3 millimeter of bone loss. And in another group, we have sold a virus and then we silenced the, uh, the nerve, but we, we uh, administered the control, which showed the progression about uh, a 0.1 millimeter additional bone loss after two weeks. However, in group that uh, continuously uh, silenced, the, the nociceptor is continuously silenced for two weeks by the function of CNO and inhibitory red receptor, we found that there's no more a progression of, of this periodontitis. So this experiment uh, together strongly suggests that this nociceptors can uh, increase the progression of, of periodontitis in mouse model. 
and this decrease uh, happened uh, to, uh, uh, is accompanied by reduced inflammation in, periodont uh, in periodontium. So when we uh, measured the CD45 positive leukocyte or neutrophils using flow cytometry, this after placing ligature, the CD45 positive leukocyte or neutrophils was significantly increased, but in group with nociceptor ablation, this uh, uh, change was significantly less, which support that these nociceptors increase the uh, inflammation in periodontium under the continued condition of periodontitis. And also we tested different cytokines that uh, is known to be involved in osteoclastogenesis or tissue de destruction. It's, we found that Rankel, TNF, or IL-1 beta, CSF-1, all increased after periodontitis induction, but that increase was significantly less after we uh, ablated this nociceptor. And consistently, when we counted this osteoclast numbers in alveolar bone, we found this, uh, the osteoclast number was significantly less uh, after uh, the ablation of nociceptor. So these results suggest that this nociceptor neurons magnify host responses to aggravate periodontitis and suggest the targeting of nociceptors and neurogenic molecules can offer promising therapeutic targets for periodontitis. Now we are uh, uh, having a pretty strong evidence that substance P, the neuropeptide released from this nerve terminal, actually uh, primary, uh, primarily contributes to the regulation of uh, alveolar bone remodeling. And we study how these neuroimmune mechanisms uh, uh, mediate those uh, regulation. When we further uh, expand our uh, study on the role of nociceptor in pain and degeneration in uh, temporomandibular joint as well. As you know, this temporomandibular joint disorder, TMD is a, is a major medical problem having a, uh, in, inducing some chronic pain in the craniofacial area. And often this uh, TMD condition uh, produce temporomandibular joint degeneration as well. However, there is no clear uh, uh, no information as to what is the relationship between pain and TMJ degeneration. Does, does degeneration produce pain or pain aggravated TMJ degeneration? There is no, uh, no clear uh, causal uh, relationship established. So now we are uh, studying if nociceptor contributes to this, uh, contributes to TMD, TMJ degeneration as well as persistent pain. And also we study if uh, vagal stimulation or nanomedicine mediated delivery of anti-inflammatory uh, uh, agent can treat this TMJ degeneration and persistent pain at the same time. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I convinced you that trigeminal nociceptors are an uh, intersection of chronic craniofacial pain and bone remodeling. And in all these experiments, we have been using this PEPPER as a very important tool to uh, navigate uh, uh, the, the studying, uh, dissecting the mechanisms, as well as a tool uh, to you know, therapeutically, uh, a therapeutically uh, useful tool uh, uh, that we suggest. So I would like to thank uh, all our current uh, lab members, as well as our past members. So really without their uh, dedication, uh, none of this study was possible. And I also thank our collaborators in UMB and also uh, outside uh, UMB. And I thank uh, our department, Neural and Pain Sciences, especially uh, Dr. Ron Dobner and Joel Greenspan, our uh, past, uh, uh, my past bosses, and they have been really uh, strongly uh, supportive uh, uh, for uh, my uh, research program. And Dr. Rich Traub is my current boss, and he's also very highly supportive of developing these uh, uh, neuroskeletal and pain programs. And I would like to thank all members in uh, Center to Advance Chronic Pain Research, CASPER, especially uh, Cindy Wren and Susan Dorsey, and 
Cindy is a current uh, co-director of Casper and Susan is a, a past uh, co-director of Casper. And I'd like to thank all uh, the leadership and uh, my colleagues and friends in uh, University of Maryland School of Dentistry. And I'm a part of a program in neuroscience and dental biomedical science program. I thank uh, for giving me opportunity to mentor the outstanding students from their uh, program. And last but not least, I really thank uh, uh, NIDCR, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, for supporting uh, our program continuously during the last 14 years. And thank you very much for uh, attending uh, uh, this presentation. And I will take any questions or comments you have. Thank you. Great presentation. Oh, you got one. You yeah. scared one out. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious. Do you think that the sensory neurons play a role initially during the formation of the bones uh, in the jaw uh, in, in, in establishing the pattern or maintaining that pattern uh, uh, early on in life? So. Yeah, that is a good question. So what is the role of sensory nerves on uh, the craniofacial bone development? And indeed, uh, Dr. Xu Guang Mie in our group is a developmental biologist, and he is very interested in that question. And we don't uh, ask what is the role of sensory nerve itself. Instead, we are asking what is the role of piezo uh, one and piezo two, the mechanosensory uh, receptor in our the development of the craniofacial bone and, and teeth. So that's the work is is undergoing now. Thank you for asking the question. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that talk. Thank you. I didn't know that I would understand any of it, but I did. <laughs> it was a great talk. And uh, so congratulations on this award it was richly deserved. So thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. That was pretty cool. I don't know.